Okay, everyone, <clears throat> let's get started. So um, for the moment, we are still discussing about a stream data management. We have seen uh, two different systems for stream data management, an older system from Stanford and another more recent system called KSQLDB. <clears throat> um, KSQLDB is based on Apache Kafka and we have discussed about the uh, specifics of Apache Kafka in the previous lecture. Uh, now we're going to discuss more about KSQLDB. <clears throat> so KSQLDB is a high-level API that runs on top of our Kafka streams and it translates uh, SQL-like queries into those uh, Kafka operators. I quickly mentioned that Kafka supports low-level operators like uh, filtering, for instance, and uh, here we are translating those SQL queries into um, a plan that involves those uh, simple operators. Um, KSQLDB processes a so-called collections of events, which can either be streams or tables. And I'm going to say a little bit more about that uh, on the following slides. It also supports uh, two different types of queries, pull queries and push queries where a pull query executes uh, once on the current state of the data, while the push query uh, essentially uh, is a continuous query and uh, continuously generate uh, new results if the streams that it is based upon generate uh, new results. I mentioned that KSQLDB has uh, two types of uh, collections and uh, those uh, collections essentially both store um, so-called events, which you can imagine like a row where one of the columns is a timestamp column, basically. Um, the difference between streams and tables is uh, what happens if we insert a new events, a new tuples into the corresponding collection. If it is a stream, then a new entries are simply appended. They don't override anything, uh, anything else. They're just appended to the end of the stream. So streams would be suitable to represent, for instance, historical data like uh, the development of stock prices, for instance. Um, for tables, it's a bit different. Um, for tables, we expect those uh, events to have a primary key. And to then if we append a new event, a new tuple um, to a table, it means that we are overriding prior values for the same key as the newly inserted tuple. So tables are rather meant to represent the current state. For instance, in the stock example, the table could represent the current price for each stock, but it wouldn't contain the information on historical price developments. We can create uh, collections with those uh, commands here, which uh, are clearly close to the SQL commands that we have seen for creating tables in prior lectures. Here we have an example where we create a stream and one where we create a table. Um, for the stream example, it's a price history stream. So here we are taking care of the stock market example. Um, after the create stream command, you have the name of the stream, which here is price history. And afterwards, we are defining the columns that will appear in the stream. And here we have a simple column which represents the name of the stock. Uh, and then we have a price column. And as in SQL, we are specifying the type for each of the columns. So here we have the uh, symbol column, which is uh, of type uh, string basically, and the price column of type integer. Now, the next part of that uh, statement is a more specific to KSQLDB. Um, I mentioned that KSQLDB uh, internally uses Kafka topics in order to store the data for streams and tables. And uh, here we therefore specify a corresponding uh, Kafka a topic, the a ticker topic uh, in this case. So um, this topic must already exist before we create the stream essentially uh, on top of it. We also specify the value format. We have a couple of different possibilities. 
here we choose to represent values in a JSON format. And the second command on this page here is um, a create statement for a table. So this is the current stock price because uh, if we have a new row, it overrides uh, values uh, that were written previously and have the same key. And uh, in order to uh, make that happen, I first of all need to tell the system what the key is, which column is the key column. And uh, here I say that the symbol column is the a key column. And uh, here you see the primary key command. And, uh, due to the semantics of tables in KSQLDB, generally when specifying tables, you need to specify uh, a primary key a constraint. So here the key is the symbol um, column. And if we insert new uh, events into the table, it will override the old prices for the same shares. Um, the previous commands uh, create uh, collections that are initially empty. I would first have to insert data into them to make them interesting. Um, once I have some collections already, I can also use them to derive a new collections from them with the syntax that you see here on this slide. Um, for instance, I could say that I have the general stream with a stock uh, market updates, but uh, maybe I'm specifically interested in one specific share, for instance, the uh, Apple share with the symbol AAPL. Then I might want to create a stream that uh, filters things down to updates that concern only this share. And this is what I'm doing with the first command here in the slide. So here we are creating a new stream uh, called Apple ticker that is more specific than the generic uh, version. And uh, after the uh, stream name, I can immediately specify uh, what the stream uh, should look like. And uh, here we are simply selecting um, from the price history stream created on the previous slide. Um, but here we have a filter condition in the where clause. We are restricting the symbol to AAPL. And uh, here another example, um, a little bit more complex and from a different uh, domain. Here we are creating something called the advertisement stream. And uh, we are specifying the uh, associated query uh, directly below. Uh, here we have uh, a join. We are joining a click stream um, with the advertiser table, which contains perhaps more information on the uh, on the on the companies that have uh, placed advertisements on our website. And uh, as join condition, we uh, simply require that the advertiser ID in the click stream is identical to the advertiser ID in the advertiser table. All right, so in general, if I want to derive new collections, I can create them with uh, the syntax, uh, create a stream, for instance, then the name, then S, and then uh, the corresponding uh, query specification. And uh, as you see here, again, uh, this is uh, pretty close to SQL. So if you already know SQL, then it is uh, relatively uh, quick to get used to this uh, notation. All right, now, if I don't derive a streams, um, then I might uh, want to insert data into them explicitly. I can do that again with a syntax very close to SQL. I can uh, simply write insert into the name of the stream, then the name of the columns that I want to um, insert data for. The other columns will be set to null values implicitly. And uh, finally, the values that you want to insert. So here we have a temperature stream, which apparently has a location in the temperature column. It might have more columns. And then we are inserting the value um, Ithaca and uh, 32 uh, degrees. All right. So in terms of uh, query types, um, we have two query types, a uh, push queries and a uh, pull queries. Um, they work uh, a little bit uh, differently. The uh, pull query essentially means that we only want to query the current state of the world. So the pull query executes uh, once 
and returns the data to us and then the query terminates. So it only returns a one result. Um, the push query is different because the push query keeps pushing updates to us. So it keeps running. It's a continuous query um, that keeps running until we terminate it explicitly. Um, so the push query might refer to tables or streams and it will continuously return to us the newest updates from uh, those uh, collections. The pull query only runs uh, once. There is a couple of restrictions on it. For instance, you cannot just run select star from stream with a pull query that uh, uh, might lead to larger results and the stream keeps generating a uh, new data. So the pull query is uh, restricted to uh, be applied to uh, tables. It returns one result and there's a couple of more restrictions about uh, which uh, functionality the pull query supports. I mean, all of this targeted at reducing the size of this uh, one result that the pull query returns. You can query streams and uh, tables again using uh, something pretty close to SQL uh, syntax. Here we have examples for the pull query and for one push query. Um, for instance, here for the uh, pull query, uh, I might want to get the current number of page views um, by region uh, from a corresponding table. Maybe I want to restrict my attention to the Ithaca region and then this query would return to me the current state. Um, for a push query, um, for instance, I could uh, define it on a click event stream and um, whenever there is an update uh, with the region key Ithaca, then I want to emit the corresponding update. So here you recognize the push query by this final clause, um, telling it what to do with the updates it uh, receives. So here we are emitting all the changes, all the updates to the click event stream. Now, Let's see a little bit how that uh, looks like in a practice with a KSQLDB. Uh, they recently released a, a cloud interface um, that I'm gonna use now in the following. Let me share my uh, screen. All right, and uh, now you should be able to see the uh, cloud uh, interface uh, here. Um, I'm currently um, running a small cluster with a Kafka on it, and now I'm using KSQLDB as uh, an interface. Here we are in the editor, which allows me to write uh, queries like the ones that we have uh, seen before. And um, perhaps I can just uh, start by um, writing um, a query that will create uh, a stream. Um, here, let's create a stock ticker stream, for instance. So we have the create stream command, the name of the stream. And uh, now let's uh, just follow the example that uh, we have seen in the slide. So here we want a column called symbol, which is of type a var chair. So it's a, a string of a varying uh, length. And uh, now perhaps we also have the uh, price column of type integer. Um, now I still need to link that to the corresponding Kafka topic because uh, everything is based on that as underlying infrastructure. So um, here we are setting the Kafka topic to uh, this one here. Um, that's, um, that is a topic that I have previously uh, created. And we also need to choose a value format. And for this one, let's just use a JSON. All right. So um, now I can uh, run the query over here. We are processing the query and it succeeds. Now here, 
um, we should have a new stream appearing and there it is. It is the a stock ticker of type stream. So I mentioned that KSKLDB has a streams and tables and to here that I have previously created, you see the curse doc is a table here uh, recognizable by the associated uh, symbol. And uh, here below, you see the new uh, stock ticker collection, which is of type stream. All right, so uh, now I have uh, created uh, this uh, stream. Um, let's perhaps uh, start inserting values into it. And uh, now I'm gonna create a new window. I'm gonna share it in a second. So I want to enable you to follow the updates um, as they are being uh, generated. All right. All right, and uh, here you should be able to see uh, two windows. So I have logged into the interface uh, from uh, two different uh, from two different uh, windows, basically. So um, in one window, I'm now gonna um, I'm now now gonna uh, insert data into the uh, stock ticker stream, while in the other window, I'm gonna uh, create a continuous query that uh, gives me the updates uh, to the stream. So um, first of all, let's see how we can insert data into the stream. So we have just created this uh, stock ticker stream. So now I can, for instance, run the command insert into stock ticker. And uh, here I can explicitly indicate the, the columns for which I want to specify values that would be the symbol and the price column. And now I can specify the values I want to insert and maybe now I want to insert the new price for Apple shares, for instance. All right, so I mean this uh, uh, symbol and price column specification is optional. In this case, I'm specifying values for all of the columns in the uh, stream, so I wouldn't need to uh, put it, but uh, you can put it and uh, you may use it in order to specify values only for a subset of columns. All right, so let's run this uh, query over here. All right, so this query has now executed, uh, no problems, but uh, of course, uh, in order to make it more interesting, we also want to uh, see the effect on the stream somewhere. And in order to have that, I'm gonna create a query, a continuous query in the other uh, window. <clears throat> so let's perhaps uh, create uh, a query which, um, which uh, just uh, listens for updates to the Apple share price. Um, so I can add a specification, a restriction, to the AAPL Apple um, uh, stock. And um, whenever there's an update to it, I want to emit the uh, corresponding uh, changes. All right. So here we are selecting from stock ticker, you're restricting to the symbol AAPL, and if we are emitting the corresponding changes. So now you see that this query is uh, marked as running. So this doesn't uh, seem to change either. So this will keep running until we explicitly terminate it. Um, let's see 
um, whether it does what it is supposed to and emits the updates to the stock ticker stream that referred to the AAPL symbol. So now let's say that the price slightly increases. So now we are submitting, uh, we are inserting the corresponding data. And as you see here in the query result on the right hand side, uh, indeed the update appears. <clears throat> if we try a different symbol, for instance, uh, IB, IBM. <clears throat> In that case, nothing happens because here we are not uh, satisfying the condition that is specified in the where clause of the query. Let's test again with APL. And shortly after, the corresponding update appears in the query result. I can keep doing that. You see the delay between inserting the data and receiving the data on the other side is uh, pretty small. So this uh, system seems uh, well suited for uh, real-time reactions. For instance, if I want to include anything which uh, listens for a specific uh, price thresholds for specific shares, for instance, and then tries to automatically buy or sell the corresponding shares. Now, I believe we have a question in the chat. Okay, that is a very good question. The question is, why don't we see the original $120 price in the query result? And uh, that is the, um, specific property of those uh, push queries, they only notify you in case of a fresh update. They don't retrieve the current data. They only react if there's any changes to the data. So we terminated the query with the command emit changes. So it will only emit uh, if there is changes to the data uh, since the query was created. So that is a great question. The initial um, content that I have inserted is indeed not shown in the query side. Very good question. All right. All right, so I wanted to show you a quick demo um, about what it is like to uh, use uh, systems for stream data management uh, in practice, in this case, a KSQLDB, but there's also many other systems. Um, is there for the moment any more questions, for instance, about the KSQLDB a demo or about uh, streams in general? All right, so that was uh, a little demo for a stream data management system. And uh, now we have uh, covered the stream data uh, topic. Um, we have uh, seen various examples for when we want to use data streams because um, we're dealing with things like sensors, for instance, or in 
the example a stock market update. Um, those are scenarios where we often want to react to changes in real time. And uh, with uh, stream data management systems, we can uh, do that. Um, one um, common uh, topic in uh, stream data management is uh, efficiency. In particular, we want to somehow keep the amount of data we need to store manageable, which uh, we have seen several techniques for in the Stanford stream data management system. Um, we also want to be efficient about uh, insertions. Uh, in particular, we have uh, seen how a KSQLDB uses some uh, specialized techniques in order to make uh, insertions uh, quite efficient. And uh, of course, uh, if you're dealing with a large amounts of users or large amounts of updates, then often you want to uh, go for a distributed stream management system, which we have uh, seen with KSKLDB. So we are about to start with a new topic. Is there currently any more questions on stream data management? I don't know where you're going to change the slides here. All right, so you're currently discussing about different types of data beyond relational data. And uh, the last type of data that I want to look at that is a spatial data. And uh, here you actually have a corresponding chapter in our Ramakrishnan and Gerke book, which is a chapter 28 in my edition. And uh, this one um, covers most of the material that we are gonna discuss in the following. So we have looked at graph data, we have looked at data streams, now we're gonna look at uh, spatial data. And uh, spatial data, um, that's something that uh, we all use on a regular uh, basis. If you think, for instance, of a Google Maps, it uh, stores two-dimensional spatial data. You can also have spatial data in uh, more dimensions. For instance, if you think about uh, CAT systems, then they will store information about a three-dimensional uh, object. <clears throat> now, on a high level, spatial data can be classified into two types. Uh, either we want to store information about uh, points somewhere in space, uh, which are completely characterized by a location in your n-dimensional space, or we want to store information about uh, regions, uh, which uh, could, for instance, be specified by uh, lines, boundaries um, represented as lines in a two-dimensional space or by surfaces in a three-dimensional space. Um, they may still have a location which uh, represents some kind of anchor point, for instance, the center it, but uh, ultimately here you have like a whole a set of uh, points making up the region. There's also a couple of uh, query types that are commonly associated with spatial data. Um, first of all, there's the spatial range query. And uh, that could, for instance, be show me restaurants in Ithaca, where we are defining a spatial region, which is um, Ithaca, and uh, we want to retrieve objects of a specific type within that a range. Um, we also have a nearest neighbor queries. That's also something that you might know from a Google Maps. It has a functionality to um, search for nearby uh, objects. And uh, then here it might uh, give you the uh, nearest um, the nearest objects, for instance, the nearest uh, gas station to your current uh, location uh, ranked by closeness. <clears throat> Finally, there is the so-called spatial join, and uh, that uh, could be something like uh, finding objects that are close to each other, like pairs of objects that are close to each other, for instance. You might want to 
find paths of parking lots and a hiking trails that are within a certain distance from each other. So those are the three most common types of uh, spatial uh, queries. And in the following, we're going to discuss about how we can support them efficiently. If there's a question in the chat. Okay, very good question. So the question is about how do we define the, um, the regions if you're dealing with a region data object. Um, so it depends a little bit on the application or on the scenario, but uh, typically you would uh, define them by a boundary. So um, you would not explicitly represent uh, the points within uh, the region. Um, there might be infinitely many of them, but uh, you would just specify the boundaries of the region. You will also see a couple of efficient uh, representations of regions within uh, indexes, but uh, generally you would not define them by the point, points inside of them, but rather by the boundaries that restrict the region. And often we are dealing with specific types of regions, for instance, um, things become easier as long as we are considering uh, boxes, multidimensional boxes as regions, um, but uh, which specific types of boundaries and regions we consider, that depends a little bit on the application. But that's a great question. Yeah, so we would not go for the points explicitly. All right. Now, in the following, in this part, we're gonna mostly discuss about indexing. And there has been a lot of work on indexing explicitly for spatial data because it happens that our standard indexes that we have seen in previous lectures, they don't work very well for spatial data. And in the following, we are gonna first of all establish that fact by an example with uh, B plus trees, which work well for many scenarios, but in this scenario for spatial data, they are maybe not such a good idea. Then we will discuss about uh, a technique uh, called a space filling curves where you're connecting the different uh, points in your space by a curve that uh, visits close by points um, close together. We are gonna discuss about a region a quad trees, which is an indexing structure that is specialized for storing large regions uh, of your space efficiently. We're gonna quickly discuss about grid files and then we are gonna discuss about R trees, which you can consider uh, um, adaption of B plus trees for spatial data. And this is one of the reasons why they are quite popular in practice. So let's first of all see whether we cannot simply use our good old uh, B plus trees in order to index uh, spatial data. So um, here we are dealing with a two dimensional spatial uh, data um, to keep things simple, but uh, the insights that we are generating here, they generalize to higher dimensions. And here I simply have the X and the Y dimension. And uh, perhaps I want to support range queries within uh, this region, queries of the form uh, specifying interval for X and specifying interval for Y and then retrieving all the points within uh, the corresponding box. So perhaps I could think of creating a B plus tree that uh, indexes, that has a composite uh, index key, which uses those two uh, dimensions as components. And uh, for a tree index, I always have to specify the order in which the columns are considered when composing the index search key. And in this case, I'm placing X before Y. So the composite index search key first contains X and then it contains uh, values for Y. So if you try to graphically represent um, the order that the index um, generates for the data, because uh, as you might remember in the leaf nodes of those tree indexes, the data is always uh, sorted. And uh, according to this uh, sort order, we would um, visit the points in the space in uh, the order that you uh, see here. So our index uh, search key uh, prioritizes um, X in the sort order 
This is why X changes uh, only slowly. And uh, instead, uh, we will uh, first uh, visit all the values for Y for one fixed value of X before we change the value for X. So this is the order in which the index uh, groups the points uh, in this space. And as you can imagine, retrieving data about uh, points that appear close together in the index sort order is more efficient. So if you think about different uh, queries in this two-dimensional space, for instance, the queries that you see here on the right-hand side of the slide, um, can you try to uh, make a guess about uh, which of those queries the index uh, would support quite nicely and uh, which others the index would not support so well? Okay, there's the suggestion that we would support the third one quite well. Okay, so um, it might also depend a little bit on the data properties. So here the third one, I mean, it uh, restricts the two attributes that the index um, uses as a composite key. Okay. Um, is there perhaps any scenarios where this might not work so well. And what about the other cases? Does anyone have a suggestion about the other queries as well? Okay, the suggestion is the first one would be supported well, okay. Does anyone have an opinion about the second one? If you think back uh, many lectures ago when we discussed about the conditions under which indexes are applicable to queries. Yes, very good, very good. Mm -hmm. Here basically we would have to go through all the X coordinates just to find uh, those uh, few Y coordinates that we're interested in. We have no restriction on X, so we have basically would have to iterate over all possible values of X. Yeah, exactly, yes. And frankly, in those cases, it's often more efficient to actually just uh, scan the data. So we essentially said that in those cases, if we uh, have a restriction, uh, on uh, columns that are not a prefix of the composite index key, then we won't even consider using the index. Because of exactly this problem, we would have to try out uh, different values, all the different values for X basically, in order to retrieve the associated values for Y and that is uh, not efficient. Okay, good, awesome. So yes, I think we uh, pretty much uh, covered it. So, um, I think people are in agreement that for the first case, uh, using the index is probably a pretty good uh, idea. If you think about this a curve that we are following in the two-dimensional space, then essentially we would need all of the points that we are visiting on this curve between two specific points uh, on that curve here, right? So, I mean, if we are interested in everything between two specific values of X or yeah, everything that is smaller, then one value of X, then the order in which the index uh, sorts the points in the space in is actually quite good because we will retrieve all the points we're interested in and uh, no points we are not interested in when following exactly this uh, curve in the space which represents the order in which the index uh, sorts those uh, points, right? So, um, quickly moving the chat here. All right, so here in the first case, using the index is actually a great idea. So that works really well. Now in the second case, um, according to our uh, standards, we would not even consider using the index. So here, using the index doesn't make a lot of sense because if you would follow that curve, 
then most of the points you uh, encounter on that curve uh, probably you won't even use. So using the index is, uh, doesn't really make things more efficient. Now, the third case is um, somewhat, um, at least the index is applicable because uh, we are restricting a prefix of the composite index uh, search key columns. So that is something. Um, on the other side, um, whether we want to use the index or not in this case, it depends a little bit on the data properties and on the query properties. For instance, if the restriction on X is quite, um, quite restrictive, so we want to retrieve many points from the index, then maybe we want to, we want to use it. Um, on the other side, um, even um, if that is the case um, here, we still uh, would retrieve uh, some points that we are not really uh, interested in. So um, whether we want to use the index or not in this case, it's, uh, it depends on a couple of factors, but um, it is not, uh, it, it doesn't narrow down things enough to the points that we are interested in. Just making sure there's no messages in the chat. Yeah, okay. So this is why uh, using uh, standard indexes for spatial data is a typically not a good idea. And this is why people have spent a lot of time thinking about how to optimize index structures for a spatial data. Um, if you have to bring it, if you have to summarize what the problem is, uh, we can say that uh, points that are close in the two-dimensional space, they are not necessarily close in the index. And the retrieving close by points in the index is always more efficient than retrieving far apart points uh, from the index. So uh, answering at least some range queries using this index would be quite uh, inefficient. One possibility that I could still consider, but which also comes with some uh, drawbacks, I quickly want to uh, mention it here anyway, um, is to uh, essentially use multiple a tree indexes for different dimensions. We could have a separate uh, tree on X and a separate a tree on uh, Y. And uh, if I have a range query that concerns both dimensions, I could uh, retrieve the uh, record IDs um, from the two indexes and then essentially intersect them. But um, that means, uh, first of all, I need uh, multiple indexes. Also there's overheads for the intersections. And uh, I might, even if the um, intersected result is small, I might actually retrieve a lot of data from the two uh, indexes if the restrictions, if the restriction on at least one dimension is not very selective. So um, this method also doesn't work great. So probably it makes sense to uh, come up with some specialized indexing structures. Before we do that, is there any questions uh, here on this um, motivation? All right, then uh, we're gonna start uh, with uh, one first uh, method, which is called uh, set ordering. And uh, that essentially numbers all the points in your uh, space in a way that uh, points that are close in the two dimensional or n dimensional space, they also have a close uh, numbers. The method that we are about to see set ordering it uh, is uh, quite good, but not perfect in uh, that respect. There's other methods which I won't discuss in detail, but I just want to mention the term at least ones, such as Hilbert curves, which uh, are even better according to this criterion, meaning that they keep close by points close together in this ordering. The principle of set ordering is uh, described uh, here. It, uh, first of all, assumes that each uh, coordinate uh, is represented as a binary string. And uh, then, uh, for instance, for 2D, we would essentially have uh, two binary strings, A and B, representing the two coordinates of an object. And the number that we assign to this coordinate via set ordering simply mixes the bits from uh, both of those uh, representations 
first we take the first bit from the first coordinate, then the first bit of the second coordinate, then the second bit of the first coordinate, then the second bit of the second coordinate, and so on and so forth. Now, let's see how that uh, actually looks like in a two-dimensional uh, space. So here we have a space and we assume that coordinates yeah, are quite coarse-grained and are represented by uh, only two bits. So now we're gonna number those two uh, coordinates uh, via a set ordering. And uh, we are starting with the origin, which is uh, zero, 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 zero. Now, what would be the next point in a set ordering if you apply the principle that we have seen on the previous slide? So I can quickly show that again. Below on that slide, you find the principle about how the set ordering number is formed. And if you apply that to this little example with a two-bit coordinates, what would be the next point in the plane that we are visiting? So we have started with zero, 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 zero. What comes next? Okay, I'm collecting opinions here. Okay, all right, so we already have uh, three votes, I believe, for zero, 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 one. Okay, any other suggestions? Okay, good. So let's uh, see what happens if we mix those uh, bits. We are mixing the uh, X bits before the Y bits. Um, so in that case, um, if we want to get to a one, um, we would have to get a zero from X, then zero from Y, then zero from X again, and then one from Y. Very good. So the next point would be indeed to zero, 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 one. So that is the principle. Here in red, next to the coordinates, you have the corresponding set ordering number, which is formed according to the principle that uh, we have discussed. And I see you, are, uh, you have a sense for it now. Um, you also might notice that here, I have uh, some uh, points which are um, filled blue circles and some points which are empty uh, circles. <clears throat> what I want to represent here is that the points that I'm uh, connecting, they might not be occupied. So with this method, we are ordering the coordinates in the space independently of whether we have any objects at those coordinates or not. So uh, in this case, the uh, blue circle, for instance, could represent that there is some kind of object associated with that coordinate, while the empty circle represents the case that there is no object at that coordinate. You just have the coordinate. And with set ordering, we are essentially ordering the coordinates in the space independently of which objects we have stored in the space. So uh, that is uh, one specific of that uh, method. There's other methods which are actually adapting the way in which they divide or um, sort the uh, coordinates in the space uh, to which data is present. But this method does not do this. All right, so let's uh, continue filling it in. So the next one here, we are mixing coordinates again. We are getting the zero from X, then the zero from Y, then the um, one from X and the zero from Y. So that would be a binary two. This is why this is the set ordering number. And we continue in the same way. This is uh, how it looks like. And uh, I mentioned quickly that set ordering is not perfect in keeping uh, close points close together in this uh, ordering. As you see here, in uh, most cases, we have uh, close by points in the two dimensional plane, which have a uh, pretty similar numbers according to set ordering. But uh, in uh, this case from seven to eight, we have a bit of a jump actually. So in this case, um, the set ordering doesn't seem to be ideal. 
And uh, if you're interested in this, then uh, you will find methods that avoid those uh, cases and are even better at uh, keeping close by coordinates a close in the corresponding ordering. So let's just fill this up um, until we have covered all the coordinates which has happened now. And uh, as you see here, in most cases, we keep a close by points a close together. We are essentially reducing a multi-dimensional space to a one dimension by ordering all of the uh, coordinates. And because we are doing this now, the advantage is we can essentially use standard B plus three indexes or other indexing structures in order to index um, objects uh, in that space according to their set values which represent the coordinates. And if I have something like a multidimensional range query, for instance, I could somehow look up uh, the set coordinates of uh, a region which uh, contains uh, the uh, object, or I could, if I am looking for one specific point uh, in a particular, I could uh, calculate the corresponding set value and then I could uh, query the index for uh, that uh, specific point. So we are at the end of the time slot. I'm gonna stop here the next time. We're gonna see uh, more on spatial uh, indexes and uh, we're also gonna discuss about uh, corresponding systems for processing spatial data. Have a nice day and then I see you again on Friday.